Hi, Jim. Hi, David. I forgot where I put my microphone. Uh, well, that's never happened before. <laughs> For those of you that are uh, tuning in, uh, Jim just almost killed himself on camera here a moment ago. Um, <laughs> now he's forgetting his mic. I'm beginning to question whether we should be doing this podcast at this point. Um, it's a dangerous profession. Somebody yes, it is. It is. Uh, so I'm going to get through our housekeeping as quickly as I can. Uh, are you a regular listener? Why not? Subscribe to the Practical Guitarist using your chosen podcast app. Take the time and put in a review with the service where you found us. iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play, Facebook, um, which we had somebody actually do a Facebook review for us, and they were very generous. Uh, get involved. Find our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Practical Guitarist. If you'd like to reach out to us directly, you can do so at questions at practicalguitarist.com, and we have a Twitter account now, and that is at Pract Guitarist. So P R A C T Guitarist as you would normally spell it. All one word. Uh, so we're going to start off this week with a new game. Uh, we have a game that we've been playing um, for for <laughs> basically 24 hours now. Jim had started. Uh, he's got a <laughs> handicap on me. He's got like a four day handicap. Um, <laughs> yes, I do. But we're go- what we're playing now is um, we're doing our, our year of no gear. And then oh, wait. Uh, before we go into year of no gear. I do have a piece of gear. Hold on. Oh, you got something to unveil, huh? Get it here. It's his last piece. Oh, my God, where did I put it? Where was this purchase, where Jim? Is. Oh, this was the last so, one from last week. We didn't talk right. about this yet. Yeah, but you got this three days ago, so. But we will talk about it. And the fact that it's gear, but not gear. Yeah, yeah. Because, so I purchased this. It is the Pedal Power 2 Plus. Right. Uh, from, from Voodoo, Voodoo Labs. Labs. Right. Voodoo Lab. Yep. And uh, so I got to install it. I also purchased along with it what's inside this box. It was separate. I just stuck it inside the box. It was the mounting kit because I have a Pedal Train Classic. And the Classic is one of these listed here. I'm going to put my finger over. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I think we're going to be putting videos up. So Yeah, we're starting to. Uh, uh, Jim's actually uh, modeling for the camera right now. And uh, if we do do this like a video, I'm you'll get to see it. Vanna White. Yeah. The white white the teeth and everything. Right. So, um, yes, and my beautiful blue eyes. Um, the uh, the thing that I'm doing here is not not so much tone, obviously, uh, more about the uh, utility protection of the circuits and you know utility. I mean, you can't you can't say, oh, I know I bought a new battery for my my. Um, uh, pedal so it's better unless you purposely went out and you bought some starved battery a carb cost, zinc yeah that cost a bunch of money or oh, something God. like that and that's- so i have uh my my final gear purchase was made this morning actually um i purchased a analog man sunface uh, I got so they have a bunch of different transistor options. I opted for the RCAs um, after after kind of going back and forth with uh, Mike Piera. I believe that's how you say his name over at uh, an Analog Man, and he was saying that they cut a little bit better, they clean up really good. So I wanted to try those. Um, I'm a kind of a fuzz connoisseur. I've had I think at one point I was totaling up today. I had four fuzz faces at one point. Um, I'm down to I have one fuzz face right now. Uh, that's uh, Jimi Hendrix fuzz face, and then I'm or the, the uh, Band of Gypsies fuzz, and then I'm gonna have this one. Uh, the reason I'm getting this, I'm actually talking about jamming with some guys who are a little bit older than me that are really into Hendrix tunes, and they wanted me to learn a few more um, to add to my repertoire so that we can we can play them together. So I figured I better get the right pedal for the job. Um, I can get by with the Helix for a week or two, but it's not gonna be uh, optimal, you know, when things start go- start uh, start going good. So, um, he's going to build it for me. I think there's a two-week lead time on him now. So, it's going to be a while before I get it. But that is my final purchase going into the year of no gear. So, um, there's obviously some things that Jim and I have been talking about. um, But we wanted to segue into our new segment, which is related to the year of no gear. And that is what we're not going to buy this week. What we're not buying. Yeah. What are the things that we're not going to purchase yeah. this week? So what are you? what is your main not going to purchase item this week, Jim? Do you have one yet, or do you want me to go well, first? You, well, you kind of threw one in my face today. 
um, <laughs> on Facebook. Multiple, uh, you, multiple. <laughs> yeah, you tagged me. Yeah, but you tagged me in a big one, um, which I'll mention, which is good because I don't have um, a few thousand dollars on hand right now. But yes. uh, I am hoping by GearFest next year or um, the next uh, PRS event, um, you threw a McCarty model up there. Um, I thought it was absolutely beautiful. It was McCarty and whale blue. I've seen it in person. It is beautiful, Jim. Oh, you saw that one? Oh, yes, I did. Oh, you are terrible. Yep. Terrible man. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing that I, I liked about it the most, I think, was the fact that it was um, it was pretty, it was blue, and uh, most of all, it was something that uh, um, I've been looking at because, I, honestly, you know, I've been thinking about getting, you know, what am I going to get next for PRS? And obviously, I want to go like a. You, you, they don't have a. It's not a custom shop. Like like, it's it's a custom shop, but it's not a custom shop. You still have to go through a retailer who makes the order for you. Um. So uh, it's it's more of a um, it's more of a thing that that you uh order on the side and uh anyway I, i'm trying to decide do i want to go with a mccarty do i want to go with something completely personalized i'm gonna choose the woods i'm gonna let them choose the woods you know but either way i kind of i don't know i'd probably go through either moore's guitar moore's is up in baltimore it's one of the closest um prs places that i can do this with um i think you might be able to through, do it through Guitar Center. I'm not Jim, sure. You could just do it at, at, at Sweetwater. I mean, we're going to be there for Gear Fest. And I could always do it through You could Sweetwater. pick up all the ones they have. You don't even have to select anything. And they got oh. 10 tops for like $1,000 less than list. Uh, that so. was the one. That was one of the ones you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. Like I list. think it was $3,200 when I saw it. Or $3,299. Oh. And, that, by and the way, that makes was, me the price tag on it now is $4,100. Yeah. Yeah. So that's incredible. Um, my not gear I'm not going to buy this week item is uh, the Boss wireless unit. Uh, the, I forget what the model number on that thing is. Um, got to see one when I was at Gear Fest. Thought it was really cool. I need a wireless. Um, I'm starting to get to the point where I just tired of dealing with cables on the floor of my house. So if I'm just playing, like if I'm not recording, I don't need a wire. I don't need a cable. Uh, I don't need uh, one of them. One of those snakes that. A sinusoid chases people with. Um, so <laughs> I, I decided that uh, I need a wireless, uh, and I decided this morning, and actually that was the thing that almost derailed me buying a fuzz. So uh, I decided against it. I said, I can go a year with wires uh, or cable uh, again, and I'm already regretting it. But uh, <laughs> it's a year. I got, I, I got time, and somebody, maybe one of our listeners might grant me a wish and send me a wireless unit. No, I doubt it, that. I doubt it. But I it sincerely is doubt that. It's happened, it's happened in the past with people. Um, um, one of the things that uh, I like to to uh, do is, I, so I, I'm wired and wireless sometimes. It depends on what I'm doing. Um, this is my home, like, little practice area that I've got. I've got two, actually. And um, so when I set up, I'm at, uh, you know, usually you would think, oh, you're home and you've only got like a, I think this is a 10 by 12 room. It wouldn't be that much. But to be honest, it's still, I'd still rather have um, wireless because I don't like stepping on things. And what's worse is, so you know how I, I was talking to you about barefoot buttons, which we didn't talk about whether or not those are gear, but um, I was thinking about buying some barefoot buttons. The thing about barefoot buttons is you have to be barefoot to use them. And I actually almost never go barefoot. What do you mean you have to be barefoot to use them? Never go barefoot. I see these guys on, on these um, these shows, and I go, how do you do that? I can't go near my button without feeling the pain before yeah, I ever yeah, touch but, it. But, but you can use barefoot buttons with shoes? Yeah, that's what I would use them for. Yeah. Shoes. Well, actually, like um, I was thinking more along lines, like when I'm wearing my um, my slippers, you know that that it would be um, something that. You and they also use. make the tall boy too, which is kind of cool. If you have you know, you have a yeah. mul- uh, like kind of a, a slanted pedal board, and so sometimes yep. it'll be harder to hit hit those pedals in the back row, and the tall yep. boy can help remedy that. Um, 
Or you can just buy really tall petals like the Canaglia, which is uh, <laughs> that's been been toted lately. That it's a tall petal. It's very high. Yeah, yeah. So, um, anyway, uh, Sean Wright is actually in our group. If you're interested, you can hit him up. Um, I'm sure he's willing to give you a Canaglia if you if you pay him the appropriate sum. Um, yes. I, I listened to a lot of demos on that, and it was an interesting sound. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't want to talk about Sean. He's, he's to be honest, I'm courting him to be on the show. So, um, Oh, so that's cool. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure he'll be yeah. on. I'm sure he will. So just a matter of time, guys. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, um, so I, I have two wireless systems. I use an X-Vive. That's the one I use at home. I use a Shure. Um, uh, system for when I'm on stage, it's because the Shure it has a backpack, you know, the pedal. The, right. It's not that little bug looking thing. And it, yeah, and to be yeah. honest, I just I I can't see me using the Boss or the Line Six for that reason. But that said, I can tell you right now, I've had the Shure so long, the little clip it has, that thing doesn't clip anything anymore. So I just shove it in my pocket. Yeah, and and I just. You know, so I'm thinking I might have to extend the cable because even though the cable, the cable's about, I don't know, what is that, 10 inches, 12 inches. Um, it, I can't wrap it through the um, strap and stick it in. Um, and it's not a 90 degree cable because it's made right. for everything. I wouldn't be surprised if Boss doesn't come out with a 90 degree angle plug. Uh, I no. get like why you would be against the, um, the bug style because they. Like if your input jacks are not tensioned properly and stuff like that, you were, you can run into issues there with the thing falling out or whatever. Um, well, my very first remember when the bug first came out, there was one called the bug. Yeah, it was, it was a Samson unit, wasn't it? <clears throat> yeah, Samson. I bought that um, right when it came out. It was relatively brand new, and um, let me tell you something. It was awful. It it, <laughs> it worked well, but I had a strap. And a Les Paul, I was using it for, so I have a, I have a double case. It's not sitting in this room. It's in a closet over. I have, um, so I always took a strat and a Les Paul and this thing, you know, touted itself. Oh, you can never pull it out. Look at this. You put it in this jack. And so we're not talking about a, a, an inexpensive, I American standard Stratocaster. And it was a, um, my Les Paul at the time was a, uh, ash, a swamp ash Les Paul, which mm. were, it was the first, really one of the first sub one thousand dollar Les Pauls a long time ago, um, and that bug fell out every time I moved. The purpose of having a wireless is to be able to get around, and when I would move around animated, it would fall right out. So I just, yeah, there was a lot of complaints on that one because it was heavy. They had yep. so that was before uh, the digital wireless revolution, um, really kind of ushered in by companies like Line Six. Where your, uh, you had to have a huge transmitter. Yeah. And now, I mean, now it's basically like Bluetooth or, or, or less. I mean, it's yeah. it's very very small and it's very high fidelity. Um, so that's why I think that system now has more of a place because it's not as heavy. If you don't have coils of you know wire and stuff in there, and I remember the the, the bug system because I looked at it. Um, it, it was expensive. Number one, which. It was expensive because of what it was, not because of it offering any significant features to the competition. But it was also very, very heavy. And I right. and I even remember thinking, like, how how much tension do you have to have on your jack in order to hold that thing in? Because it right. was, I mean, it's it's easily twice the weight of a cable from you know the distance from the guitar to the floor, easily. So that's why I was like, that's that's weird. Um, but that being said, I if you, I mean, you could always take your strat jack off and god take the strat plug jack the thing that the plug goes into <laughs> take it off the guitar and then bend that thing so that when you put the plug in it holds it better right and um when you um uh so th for the new one the x vive um i uh i actually um use that a lot it does weigh nothing i mean it it feels like it weigh, like it, it it weighs like maybe the weight of two pencils. Yeah, I have it over here. But even if I pulled it out and showed everybody, you can look it up online. Um, the uh, um, the size of it or the weight of it um, is is minuscule, but mm -hmm. you wouldn't be able to see that 
in a you know in this thing anyway. Right. But it doesn't even weigh as much as a capo, a typical capo. That's so. interesting. Or is that capo? No, that's a capo. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so um, that's another thing. I, I, I probably won't buy a second wireless until somebody comes up with something that's, like, way beyond. You mean a third wireless? Yeah, a third wire. Yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, <laughs> another so, one. Yeah, I've got my, my um And it will be at least a year away from now. Yeah. And, well, <laughs> so, is that a cable? Well, yeah, because the only reason I would buy a wireless now is because it would be some kind of tone improvement over the current wireless system. And the and I'll be honest, I'm not enough of a tone snob, um, and I don't I don't use the word snob in that negative way um, to say I need that um, wired sound. I mean, it was I don't remember who it was, but there was this um, guy that would use a hundred or seventy five foot cable. Because he wouldn't go wireless, but he wanted that distance. I just can't imagine the what they had to have at the other end of it to. It's like, it's like it's like back in the day when they used to do television production. And they used to have the trucks that were filled with cables, so they could just tap yes. in. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They'd have literally the big, huge coils of cable. Mm-hmm. For this. <laughs> just insane. So um, yeah, that's my week of not buying stuff. Uh, I don't know how we're gonna get through this. But we'll do it. <laughs> like 52 more to go, right? 51 more now, to go. Now, uh, I do want to mention something that kind of goes into our other topic. I happen to have right here. Uh oh. I got to hide this. This is where right. Jim's going to spend all his money right here. This is work thing. No. no. Oh. I've already, already purchased it. So, Greg Cock, Gregory Cockery, yep. um, has released a new instruction thing. <laughs> And for me, one of the ways that I like to learn, as a matter of fact, I want to talk a little bit about um, a question. I might, I might have uh, to get this book, high, too. <laughs> high school friend. Of so this is Greg Koch, and yeah. it is Gregory his Cocker, new book um, from Hal Leonard. Um, you can get it through Greg Koch's website, uh, and I recommend using Greg Koch's website. I got it, and as you can see right here, that he is his real autograph. He signed it. How because about the that? first. Yeah, the first X number of them he signed personally. Um, it comes with, I'm not going to show you the code, but there's a code inside where I can get the music. Cool. and um, The jam along with. So it's the called phone. The Brave New Blues Guitar. Um, three hours of video lessons. And then, of course, all the tab is in here. How much a book cost? And it was, I got it for less than this. The book is $10. Video is Ten dollars, so it's just under twenty. It's oh, actually nineteen ninety nine. Hell yeah, I'll do that. <clears throat> and for three hours of Greg Cock lessons, and I'm sure he like actually. I'll take it. It's not like beginner lessons either. I'm sure it's advanced. No, no these are so these are um, advanced lessons. There's uh, one called Pagey. Okay. So you can imagine what that one's about. No, I I have no idea. Is it going to be about? <laughs> is it going to be about uh, Zappa's Black Page? Pen Becked. I wonder who that one is about. Um, uh, Odele. Hendrick C. and Stu. I wonder who that guitar player is. That be. one I think I figured it out. But. Beck Boogie. Oh, that, that no, is. that's got to be Stevie Ray Vaughan, right? Eric and Freddy Mashup. So it's. it's oh, um, he's going to talk about Burger King. Yes. So he, he does list the uh, musicians on the back here, if you guys can I, I get it out of the... I, I got to get this thing, yeah. So it's a very good book, and I, I recommend it wholeheartedly. Where'd you get it? You get it directly um, from, uh, from Greg? Directly from Greg. I went right to his site. As a matter of fact, um, he used to do... He's been real busy lately, so he hasn't been doing I'm it lately. He used to do tonight. a weekly... Yeah, he used to do a weekly Wednesdays or Tuesdays. He do he did like a lunchtime thing where he'd go live on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. No, I've been watching a lot of his back... Facebook stuff that he's uploaded to YouTube and stuff like yep. that. <clears throat> and so I would, um, as a matter of fact, there's a big long coil, coil uh, off his guitar there. I would watch his stuff weekly, and of course he uses everything from jazz chords to old, um, and, and those old uh, 20s style um, and 40s style jazz um, uh, interludes and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh I'm not sure where I was going with that because I forgot yeah. where we started. Just the with greatest it. player on but earth. Yeah, and- I, I I went through his website. His website said, "Yeah, I got this book coming out. 
um, go to my website and download it or get it. And that's what I did. So Hal Leonard is the publisher, but I, I don't think you'll find this in a bookstore. I recommend it. I highly recommend it. So we'll put a video or we'll put a link up to the uh, be able to get this book on the. I'm I'm definitely going to get that one. Uh, so this week's topic this directly relates to it. This week's topic is how do we get good at guitar? Okay. Yes. Uh, not to say how we start playing guitar, but how we get good. Meaning, uh, you know, you've you've been playing for three years. You got enough technical facility that you can sit down and learn a tune. Uh, maybe you have enough ear training that you can do it by ear, but you don't necessarily know all the minutia of how to advance beyond that, right? Right. So, Jim, walk me through. How would you do it? Okay, so that's a good question because when I was um, uh, staying with a friend after the experience PRS, he asked me, how did you learn to play guitar? And I said, well, I had a lot of family members that play guitar, so there was a lot of guitars laying around. And everybody knew a little bit. There were cowboy chords, there were right. a few jazz chords. They didn't know that it was a seventh or a ninth or whatever. So nobody could say, Jim, this is an E7, nine. Right. You this figured that the, out later. Right. Right. Uh, the, and Hendrix was still alive. So um, they were like, yeah, this is the Hendrix chord and um, stuff like that. So as time went on, um, I learned by watching other people do stuff, which is why things like this is important to me um, because. For me, videos are, are what really allowed me to reach beyond my family. So when when a show like Saturday Night Live started, I was a, I was a youngster when Saturday Night Live kicked off, um, but I was old enough to stay up and keep TV low enough so my parents didn't know, but I could watch my guitar heroes um, from certain bands play on Saturday Night Live, and I was able to go, oh, yeah. And, of course, um, back in those days, we had a lot of TV shows, and, and the names um, – uh, escape me of the exact shows, but um, I would see people like Cream and and um, uh, to the Bee Gees. I mean, you would see everything from the Carpenters to whoever. And I'm not talking about American Bandstand. This is before they made the decision, hey, you know what? We should all be um, uh, doing this um, miming. So uh, Bandstand at one time, you know, had live music, and then, of course, they moved on to where they mimed. And I'll never forget one of the mimes I saw was Prince. One of the early mimes that I remember very distinctly was definitely mimed was Prince. And when he was first came out, he was on American bandstand and uh, his bass player got a little too animated and kicked his microphone stand over and the, and the vocals kept going. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those, yeah, well, fuck it. Just keep on going. But um, anyway, yeah, so one of the ways that I did it was very – I'm a visual person. I kind of have to see it. Um, and then – so for me – and everybody learns differently. Um, so not um, not to brag, but I'm a master training specialist. What that means is that um, I went to school to learn how to train, right? I'm not a teacher, and I'm not saying I'm a great teacher. I am a trainer. There's a difference between the two. And what that is is hands-on training. So. Um, for me, it's I have to listen, watch, do. That's my process. Right. And if I can't do, if there's no do after watch, it's gone. It's just gone. Right. So I'm you, you, am I okay to interject and start my <laughs> Yeah. All right. All right. So I have a three step plan. Because I do everything organized, right? Complete load of horse shit. But um, nevertheless, I have a three-step plan. The first step is see good guitarists. So what that means is talk to your musician friends. Find out who they think are good musicians. Find out who other people think are good musicians. Go to your local stores. Talk about who's you know who do they like, um, who they think are great musicians. Read your polls. You'll see those guitar player polls and stuff where people are like, oh, these guys are the top ten players right now. Find a couple you like and go see them. Go see them live. Uh, can't stress that enough. Um, that's step one, right? And what that's going to do is it's going to, number one, give you an idea of what to shoot for. Number two, it's going to show you like where the bar is at. Number uh, three is that you can then start to develop your ear listening to these guys. Because a lot of times they're on another level. 
And I find that even if you've got technical facility in the instrument and you can do things that, you know, like let's say somebody goes, oh, I want you to play a Steve Vai tune. You're like, all right, I'll figure it out in a couple of days. And then you can sit down, you can actually woodshed it and you can get it out. The reality is you may not understand that tune. And that's, that's where, like, the difference between a great player and a good player is. Like, a good player can figure the tune out. A great player understands why it works. And that's because... Um, yeah, they may not necessarily have like the the musical theoretical terms behind it. They may not be able to explain the theory of it, but they understand it because they're like, "Well, he's doing this thing that I heard Hendrix do, you know, and he's putting it against these chords, and it works well in that context." It's just uh, basically understanding the piece of music, understanding how it's grouped for, for rhythmic voicings and stuff like that. Um, you're going to get all that stuff from experiencing it, not from denying yourself. So if you think you're good. And you're still playing, you know, three or four chord rock tunes with, you know, just palm mutes and downstroking. Chances are you're not that good. Like, I, I'm not saying that you can't be good. I'm not saying that that's not, uh, you know, maybe what you aspire to be. That's fine. I'm just saying that don't judge yourself like up next to somebody like Guthrie Govon and expect that you're going to be able to, you know, hold your own with him. Um, so. Guitar is not a competition, and I think that goes without saying at this point. Uh, guitar is a completely subjective thing. You know, good people, bad players, like, bad just means that you don't like them. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad players. Um, so, the second part of my three step plan is to seek out regular guitarists. And this is going to be for different reasons. The jam with, that's the main thing. And then you always want to look for those guys that are just a, a cut above you, maybe, maybe two steps up the ladder from you, and get lessons from them. Pay them to show you some stuff. And you don't even have to do regular lessons. Just go and say, look, I want to spend 20 bucks. I want to sit down with you for an hour, and I want to figure out what you do. I want you to show me some stuff. And then go home and figure it all out. And just do it yourself and work your way through it. And keep doing that until you feel like you've got a repertoire built up. I didn't do it that way. So what I do is I, I was always the only guitar player in the bands I was in. Um, I did the seek out or seek out the good guitarist thing and go see them live, right? I'm still doing that. And then I did, I'll jam along with other people and stuff like that, uh, but not necessarily guitarists. And I think in a lot of ways that makes you a better musician, but it helps to have guitarists around. I've seen a lot of young guys that are starting in guitar who struggle because they don't have just like regular Joe guys that are around them to show them, hey, look. This is this is the basics. And this is what I know how to do, and you can do this too. And then, um, as far as the lessons are concerned, like I said, look for somebody that's like two or three steps above you. Don't look for somebody who's like ten steps above you, because it's going to be over your head. And a lot of times, that's so. There's yeah, a guy, and it, it'll be disconcerting. You'll just it, it, it's chances are you'll just give up unless unless you look at it and you're like challenge accepted. Uh, right. It's not going to work for you. Now, I will tell you this much: there was an there's an old guitar player. Um, who's now deceased, uh, I think he died in the late 80s, early 90s, Danny Gatton, right? Danny Gatton is legendary. He's one of the greatest tele players on planet Earth that, that ever walked planet Earth. Uh, he used to get guys to come in and do lessons with him, and it would be 100 bucks. and we're talking about like the late 70s, $100 a lesson, right? And he would record a tape, and he'd give you a copy of the tape, and he'd say, you can come back for your second lesson when you've learned everything on the tape. And almost nobody came back for that second lesson. So he was just taking their money. But the whole point was that Danny Gett was so damn good, nobody could figure it out. Like, you couldn't figure out how he was picking certain things. He could sit there and show you, and you just wouldn't be able to do it. Um, and that, that's what I'm saying. Like, you don't want to look for that guy that's five steps above, or like 15 steps above you, because that's Danny Gatton, Right. You're just going to be disappointed. You want to look for the guy that's attainable and just keep stepping on the people that are attainable until you get to that point where you feel comfortable and you can accomplish the music you want to do. Well, so, yeah. So as a teenager, when I was when I was growing up, we had these things called drum circles. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. We had the, we would get together. You know, obviously you'd find groups of people. And I don't think that's gone. Um, I just think that it's less and less as YouTube creates this um, group of of 
guitar players that that oh I can go to Justin Guitar and I can go to this guitar and there's nothing wrong with that. Please don't think I think there's those anything wrong with that. Those resources are I useful too. Those are resources are good too, especially when you don't have the opportunity for that. But if you're in an area where you can get together with two, three guitar players, then there's always going to be that one person that plays a little bit better, and then the next person that plays, you know, in the middle, and then there's going to be the beginner or the person that's just kind of hanging. The, and those positions will change. There will be a juxtaposition. Oh, yeah. Well, not even that. Um, like it's just the level of techniques. Like so, like I'm good at lead playing, but the other right. guy's good at rhythm playing. Like those are the different things you got to realize. Is that everybody has their strong points too? Yeah. And so as you go along, you learn things from each other. And as I said, I'm a I'm a watch, um, a, you know, a do kind of person. I have to I have to see it. I have to hear it. I have to see it. I cannot like I know how to read music, but I can't play music I'm reading. I know that sounds silly, but I can't figure out how it's really, really voiced or how it's really, really um, notated to be able to do that. I know there are people that can do it. And I know that it's a basic concept yeah. that some people learned, you know, in the third grade at band. I just can't do it. I have to hear it and see it and then do it. Um, but anyway, uh, I think it's important, that, just like you're saying. So if you can go out to jams or you can go out to open mics, even if you don't get up on the open mic, Go there and watch the people that are playing. Talk to See them. what they're doing. Yeah, ask them questions. How did you do that? Can you show me that? Hey, if we got together, can we jam? You know, don't be afraid to to trade phone numbers. Most and- musician people are, it's a community, and they're open about this stuff, and they want to seek community with others. Uh, fact is, we like to think that there's this huge group of musicians in the country, but, m- but most of us are not active on that level. Most of us are playing in our bedrooms. I mean, if you want to get active on that level, it's attainable. You just got to ask. Yeah, and you you really want to, you know, take that time. And, okay, so you talked about how you do the, the, the thing of writing and, you know, and, and technique and everything. And sure. It wasn't until I was probably, I don't know, 30-something that I learned the notes of a scale, the modes, sure. the, the stuff. Now, so I spent 20 years or so playing guitar, no, more than that, almost 30 years playing guitar with no knowledge of that. That actually opened up. It didn't. This is what I learned. I'm very mathematical. So I learned patterns quick. Yeah. And um, so I used to, I knew that, like, if I put my finger here and I put my finger here, that was a certain tone. But then I learned that's a third, that's a minor third, that's a you know that's a fourth, that's a diminished, that's a fifth, that's a flat six, so on and so forth. Then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I can I can actually um, translate this into scales and so on and so right, forth. Right. But the biggest thing was because it was already relatively ear trained, and this is what I want to get to is it's important to ear train too. We a lot of people get caught in there. They're like, okay, I got the pentatonic scale. And the pentatonic scale exists because it's the easiest scale to use. It always works. And we could, in theory, talk about why it always works. The minor pentatonic scale will always work because we have certain notes that get left out. Right. And when you use a certain chord progression, especially in rock and roll, <clears throat> you're going to wind up where Every single note in the pentatonic scale, the root, will work in all of the um, chords that you're going to use. Um, and we could talk about the fact, you know, it goes major, minor, minor, and so on and so forth. Right. But um, the, the thing is that, so then you've got the major pentatonic and the minor pentatonic. And why is the major pentatonic? Oh, well, because the major pentatonic is actually the minor pentatonic. It's the same thing. G major pentatonic is E minor pentatonic. Right. right? You just and got another right. relative major or minor. Yeah, that's correct. Right. So you have to know your E your minor is G major. Correct. Yes. And you can, and at that point, and this is where I, I went, wait a minute. If E minor is, and this is the thing where I went, so G major is E minor and C major is A minor. Wait hmm. a minute. If I put my finger on the eighth fret, that's C, and I put my finger on the fifth fret, that's A. And I put my finger on the third fret, that's G, and the zero fret, that's E. Hey, wait a minute. There's always three notes between. Oh, 
So the relative minor is just three notes down from the major. Yeah, yeah. Once you start seeing so those patterns, I, it becomes super easy. So I, I wrote a little thing a long time ago. You only need to know one scale. Right. In all reality, you really only need to know one scale. Yeah, because... All the other scales are built on the other one scale. Well, yeah, for the most part, because well, that's that's excluding your, your uh, modern scales, like like uh, yeah. diminished, old yeah, tone, but, uh, bop. Different yep. scales like that. So, what I'm saying is that that in in the twelve note chromatic um, scale pattern that we have, we can we can develop every scale from that. Right. So <clears throat> there is no oh unless you're I, I I just recently heard that there's an H, but only if you're in Europe. There's parts of Europe, and you can look it up. Well, there's uh, things. There's multi. Say, yeah, but but now you're talking about multitonal or uh, microtonal rather. No, once you, they, once you they, start dividing they it have, up, they don't have like um. Instead of you know how we have a a sharp b b sharp you know or, or not b sharp c we have b c so on and so forth. They have an h in there that rep- replaces one of those places where we have no movement between the two. Oh, so it's just so a nomenclature thing. It's still it's still yeah. one of the twelve tones, but it's yes, just exactly. named differently. All right, makes sense. All right. Um, now now when you go to the microtonals. Like a lot of Eastern music. Yeah, forget right? it. <laughs> yeah, and that's where your ear chain is going to become real, real friendly. <laughs> yeah, if you learn to, if you want to learn to, the sitar, then you're way beyond us. <laughs> yeah, you're in another, you're in another league. If you're to that point where you're like, man, these twelve tones suck. I'm bored with them. Like then, then you'd, we're probably not the podcast for you. <laughs> yep. Move along, move along. Uh, yeah, uh, not not that you might not find value here, but uh, we're not the, the theory stuff we talk about. You're not. <laughs> so as far Sorry. as up. Uh, as far as my three rules go, that's one and two, right? So right. to recap, it's see good guitarists and yep. seek out regular guitarists and people slightly above you. Number three is don't say no. Yes. And that's a real fun one because I'm starting to learn that one now. So I got, very important. I got the call from these guys and they're like, oh yeah, we should get together and play. And they're like, what, what songs do you know? I don't want to just noodle around. I'm like, oh shit, here we go. So I sent them a list of songs that I can play pretty easily, and uh, came back and then, cover. No, and then they sent me a list of songs that no. they play pretty easily. I don't know how much covering we're gonna do, but I could definitely be singing some Hendrix tunes real soon. Uh, which was funny because my brother asked me to sing Hendrix tunes to him today because uh, we were talking about it, and he's like, "Can you sing any of that stuff?" And I'm like, "I started singing the, uh, I don't remember what song it was." It oh, it's probably Fox. No, it was, Fo- it was Foxy Lady, and he's like, he's like, oh, he's like, actually, you're not bad at it. <laughs> so, um, uh, Foxy, yeah. Um, so, the thing is, like, normally I would have turned that down, and I would have been like, you know what, I really don't want to play cover tunes. I want to get together with a bunch of guys to play some of my originals. But I'm thinking, like, maybe if I do 50 percent originals, 50 percent covers, I can actually make a decent amount of money at it, and maybe get some promotion and stuff. So I'm like, well, all right, I'll I'll do this. Let, let's let's get together. Let's talk about it. So I started playing uh, Hendrix tunes that I have never played before. Like never actually taken the time to learn the whole tune out before. Uh, I was playing. Uh, I figured out all of the parts for uh, Manic Depression now, and uh, I'm gonna start working on uh, my version of Purple Haze this week because my version is incorrect and I know it and I've known it for years. Um, and I'm gonna start working on. Uh, probably a more correct version of Red House and stuff like that, but um, I know that I have to adapt. And because I said uh, I said yes, that means I'm going to have to work my ass off to make this happen. And I want to tell listeners, even if you feel like you have, you're overwhelmed and you have to work your ass off, even if you get 50% of the way, even if you fail miserably, you're still going to be a better player for it. So I'm going to I'm going to say this about we 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 did the cover original thing a couple weeks ago and I want to say this about that. Um it, even if you're going to do original tunes together, covers gives you a place to start. Right. Even if you wind up I, today I was um I was in the church. And I was playing with the rest of the band while we were waiting for some of the vocalists to show up. And then I started playing this thing and then everybody followed along with me. At the end, they were like, man, that was really cool. What was that? I said, I don't know. I just made it up. <laughs> it was, and, it, it, you know, it was like we just wrote an original piece in 10 minutes waiting for the you know, people well, to show that, up. And that's part of the reason why it actually – so I got, 
I have a backlog of songs. I have 10 or 15 songs that I can't play with the uh, the uh, project I'm working with right now with the singer-songwriter, uh, Black Death Doctors, because they're technically challenging. I mean, I got a part... I got, I got one song that's in 15-4 time. <laughs> Good luck. You know, it's like, you, you gotta have a certain kind of musician to pull that off. And so I just put a thing out, and I said, look, here's my yeah, SoundCloud. Yeah, not me. <laughs> I was like, here's my SoundCloud. Here's a couple of songs I've written that, like, I would like to perform. And the way I went. So we'll see what happens. Like, maybe this works out. Maybe it doesn't. But like I said, at the end of the day, what am I going to gain out of this? I'm going to gain a couple of Hendrix tunes. I'm probably going to get some new skills under my belt that I didn't have before. Maybe I'll learn to sing uh, and actually well, sing while playing guitar, which would be a boon for me. Um you're also going to learn to to play off of different people. After a while, I can't, you know, <clears throat> we all see it. Musicians they get they get bored with what they were doing, right? For years and years, they played the same people, and um, there there are musicians like that. We just had the Stevie T thing. Remember, um, uh, most hated musicians, and one right, of them was right. ACDC, and because they sounded the same, they said everybody was like, "Oh, the music sounds the same." Well, well really, two brothers it, playing. I mean, for like. 30 years. Like, what do you expect? That's what's going to happen. Two brothers playing the same instruments, the same people for 30 years. It's going to sound the same because in reality, they didn't write with the bass player. They didn't write with the drummer. It didn't matter that those two guys changed out. It didn't even matter that the singer died because they really wrote it with no, no sense of vocal in mind. Right. Um, honestly, you could say some of the same for Rush. Um, as much as they changed in instrumentation over the years, and really mod the musical interplay until they were um till Getty started throwing keyboards in there and then took them back out right um so <clears throat> when you look at when you look at that that's why i recommend doing those jams like tomorrow night i'm going to be at a um open mic in virginia beach no chesapeake um and uh i'll be playing with a group of people i've never played with and i'm going to do a boys are back in town and of course, you, you think, oh, well, it's Boys Back in Town. It's just going to be these eight chords, right? But that's not the way it's going to go. Because um, then it, it's going to be me playing with a group of people I've never played with. What is their feel like? What is their groove? You know, yeah. I want oh, that. Yeah. I want that part of groove. It. But there is a certain, everybody has a different way of feeling the groove. Whether they're behind the beat, on top of the beat, in front of the beat, whether they they know whether they can manipulate whether they're in front of or behind or on the beat. Yeah. And that's that's true musicianship. Some but, people can't swing to save their lives. And yeah. that song swings. Oh, I love the swing. Swings hard. I love You know, swing. it's got that whole yeah. it's got I, I I know everybody probably knows it, but it's just got such a cool, groovy swing. Um, you know, that's a band that that uh, to me was underrated. Yep. Um and that's the other thing. So David Gilmour talked about how he learned, and I, I know I've mentioned this before on another episode, but um, <clears throat> in case you don't want to have to go through our whole backlog to find this. Oh, no, no. We, we, we need them to go through the backlog, Jim. Yeah, it, l- listen to everything and then come back. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> David Gilmour said what he did was he learned what every single, and I, I tend to do this myself, what every single instrument is doing. Now, that doesn't mean I know how to play the drums or know how to play the keyboards in a certain song, but I know exactly what it's doing so that I know that here's what the keyboard's going to do. I can move within that. I can play within it or or behind it or under it. And that way, I can back it up or I can lead it. And those are things that that you do, but um, I don't know. I, I I hope that's helpful to some people. That's one of the things that I do to learn. Just mess around. I'm sure it will be helpful. Um, I guess so. That's my three step thing, and it's worked for me so far. Um, I'm obviously still learning my steps because yep. I don't always say yes, and I'm starting to say yes more. Um. You said yes to this podcast a few months ago. Yeah, it's, and it's been one of the greatest decisions of my life, I'll be honest. Um, I had I had to dry, drag this guy kicking and screaming at no, a podcast. You bullshit. I did. I, I, so I reached out to him. We were we were friends in another podcast um, uh, group, the 60 Cycle Hum. And uh, I said, hey, I'm, I, I want to do this podcast. I've been looking at doing it for about a year. But um, I, uh, I want to co-host because... 
so many of these things get get so boring listening to one person's voice, no matter how good or bad it is. Um, and we all see it. So I said, would yeah, you, if be- you don't. <laughs> that's why I don't have any YouTube content up yet, because uh, talking to myself <laughs> kind of sucks. We <laughs> we have an interesting interview coming for that for that kind of thing. But anyway, um, so the um, the thing that uh, um, I was looking for was interplay because just like any band situation, I don't want to sit here and talk to myself all day because that's really what you're doing, regardless of the fact that there's a camera and there's people on the other end and you're answering questions or whatever. It's really just, it's really still just you and you. Yeah. Because because really, if we had a live feed going of questions, they'd be moving so fast. It'd be like, yeah, 15, 15 things ago, somebody made a comment about how. Wait, what? You know, what did he say? Yeah. Oh, let me scroll back. Um, um, no, um, listen to all that dead air. You guys would all be asleep. You probably sleep by now anyway. Well, that's because I'm. I've got a boring voice. No, I'll just yell at him for a minute. Wake the fuck up. So, um, with that, you know, some of the stuff to uh, talk about in the in the group is, you know, what are what are some of your favorite ways of of learning? Not everybody wants to jam with somebody else. Not everybody wants to use videos or learn from Greg Cock. Uh, um, but they should. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, but I uh, again. Um, there are people that I, I read these interviews and I find them almost impossible to believe. But I read an interview, I can't remember if it was Rudy Shanker. I want to say it was Rudy Shanker or Michael Shanker. Yeah, it's Michael, Michael Shanker. The, he was MSG and UFO, right? Yeah. Um, he said that he refused to listen to other people's music so that he could only, you know, play what, without any external influences. And I wanted to think, I thought to myself, you know, how does that work? How could you possibly have anything inside to create if you don't have any influences from which to build? I have two more pieces of advice. Um, One is find your own way that works, too. Just because Jim and I are laying out our plan or his plan, uh, my plan, his plan. Uh, find your own way. If you work better by sitting in your room playing by yourself like Michael Schenker, fine. Nobody's going to tell you no. Maybe that's a completely creative thing for you to do. However, uh, just make sure that you're actually making progress. You have to be able to measure yourself up. So the thing like with Michael Schenker is like, yeah, I don't play with anybody else. I'll guarantee you he did when he was younger because... He had he had to he had to know what the bar was. Uh, you're on mute, Jim. Oh, sorry. Rudy is his brother, right? I don't know which which one is older. I don't know because Rudolph Shanker from the Scorpions. Because Michael played with the Scorpions for a little while, right? I want to say I didn't one know of they them were brothers. Old. Yeah, I'm I'm almost a hundred percent sure they're brothers. But Look, um, so they had to learn from each other at some point. I wish one of my brothers was musical. My brothers couldn't even, they couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. <laughs> was... uh, Michael is younger. Okay, so that means Rudy was playing first. And Rudy was in the Scorpions before Michael, I think, left the house. And the train is coming. And my train. I live, for those who um, have not heard it before, I live about um, 100 yards from railroad track. It's going to be our ongoing joke. And it is always going by, so it's just something that I have to live with. because it. Um, I say it goes by fast. Yeah, just like, like my kids always got wandering, a to, like my kids wandering into the background during the episode, and or my dog that you saw, he's laying down over here now, but he was walking back and forth. He'll he'll meander. If I didn't let him in here, he would be sitting. I have a all that keeps him out from a door that's over here is a baby gate. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> not gonna work <laughs> because if I didn't have that, he would be sitting there whining and crying and barking, and it would be terrible because I have a big. Labrador, again, you'll see him a hundred times. Yeah. <laughs> so, the other piece of advice that I wanted to give our, our is mm-hmm. what Nita Strauss said. Yes. Don't worry about what other people think of your playing. Just yes. fucking keep doing it. Yes. 
That's, you know, that's probably the hardest thing that we all do. I remember when I was young um, and I started singing and my cousins um, said, oh, that's awful. They're just teasing you. Well, <clears throat> but but I understand. Like, you yeah, take it, it, that it to heart because you're like, yeah, hurt. I don't it know what to six say. Six-year-old kid or a seven-year-old kid, it hurt. Yeah. And, yeah. And then there was the part of me that said, Q, I'm going to do it. And not only am I going to do it, I'm going to do it better than either of you. Right. But it, it took time to to get through that. And then I can, I know that all of us has done it. You, you sit down, you play guitar, and you think, oh, man, I'm good. I'm doing good. Then you, you either see or sit down and play with or listen back, and you go, oh, I can't believe I made that mistake. If you think that people like Guthrie Gavon or whatever, I remember one time. Um, That's why Greg board Cock tapes was, exist, folks. Greg Cock was um, doing that live thing on Facebook, and, and he, made a, he made a clanker. He made a clonker. And I wrote in there, I said, you know, thank God you're, you're, you know, you're human just like the rest of us. And he, and he actually responded. He said, he said, Jim, um, uh, it's something to the effect that we all make mistakes. And if we don't make mistakes, we don't learn anything or something like that. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of cool. And that's the thing. You will not work harder if you don't make a mistake. You, if you pick up a guitar and you're perfect from day one, God bless you. Yeah. Well, we know somebody who's on the verge of that at this point. Yeah, but I, I I can't do it, and I know most of us can't do it. I'm sure so some can't. Just just learn to play the guitar. Do it to the best of your ability, and just because you can't, I I don't shred. I know David Gilmore said he's just not a shredder. You know, <clears throat> it's not that he doesn't want to or didn't didn't know. It's just that that's not his thing. It wasn't his style, and I don't have that speed in my fingers. I never have. And so I work to the best of my ability, and I work around it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're a shredder. Is that what you consider me? Well, you do shred. I, I know the shred techniques. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't put myself in genres anymore. I know that sounds so fucking uh, pretentious, but this, this guy that plays fifteen four time. Oh, excuse me while I pay No, that's progressive music. I play progressive music. I ain't even going to lie about that. But as far as my what guitar... What does this 15-4 sound like? Anyway, I'm trying to... I am literally trying to vision it in my head. When you get head. done with this, I'll play it for you. <laughs> hey, you should put your SoundCloud thing in the in the notations for this. So yeah, people... maybe I will. Maybe I will. I don't know if I have that one up there or not. I think I do. I thought you did. It's one of the final ones, right? Because I thought, oh, this is like... Because you always told me that you like to score... Um, you oh, know. No, it's not a, It's not an orchestral piece. No, not like that. But I do write orchestral pieces. I have one that's a string arrangement with guitar over it. And... Yeah. That's pretty cool. But I'll I... put my SoundCloud on the note. That's fine. I can do that. Yeah. I'll say yes, Jim. You should say yes. You should say yes. And and if somebody says something negative about your SoundCloud stuff, tell them fine. Show I'll me tell your... them what, you, what I do Show to you yours. almost every episode. They're number one. And clearly right. they have a... Big, and that was my middle finger, by the way. That clearly that they have <laughs> a listeners who not watching. They, they must be the best ever to be able to judge me for who I am when That's I put right. in the effort and put in the time and actually know what I'm doing and making conscious decisions. That's right. Because <laughs> here's the th- here's the thing that I see all the time in in so many so many guitar player um, or guitar uh, forums and and of course you would you would see it. You know, even before forums existed, we had these things called bulletin boards. And before computers, we had just people that that would write that they were called critics. Um, <laughs> yeah, I called them assholes, but yeah. Yeah. And here's the thing. If you're so good at it, show me yours. Show me what you did. If you show me yours, I'll show you mine, Jim. And here's, you know, and I want to um, I want to say this, too. You'd always get in that argument where, you know, you'd say, I don't like X band. Right, it right. doesn't matter what the name is. Right, and then he would say, "Well, I haven't seen you sell a million records." Well, so Nickelback has sold millions of records. Saying, saying, so um, if you <laughs> you do not have to be um, great, you know, the, uh, or loved band or good to sell, sell a million, million records. records. Exactly. Um, so, 
million records shit in my face. <laughs> Be- <laughs> Before we call this episode quits, I do want to share one time where I had, and I don't think I've shared this with anyone ever before, where I had a pretty ugly setback. Um, and it actually made me woodshed a lot, several years. Um, probably unnecessarily now thinking back on it. But I, I posted, don't make fun of me, and don't date me for this, but back on Harmony Central many years ago, when I got my my first like really good amp, um, which was a Rivera R30, uh, I posted a video of me playing that thing. And actually, I took the time to make sure the video was properly recorded. And I posted, I said, don't, don't judge me. So of course, what are people going to do? They judge me. People are like, you suck. You're like, this is just noodling bullshit and all this stuff. And like, part of me at the time was like, I'd like to see you do better. But the other part of me was like, maybe I really do need to develop like my style and stuff. And so I took several years and I actually kind of backed up and said, all right, we're going to figure this out now. Um, and I also tend to be really hard on myself too. I listen to my own recordings and I go, this is shit. And it's just like that scene in uh, Metalocalypse where he deleted Thunder Horse. That, that's me. <laughs> that's Mike. Is that Mike Keneally? Who is it that's no, Metalocalypse? That's, um, oh, God. What, uh, not Keneally. Oh, I know Keneally Brand, plays with us. Brand, at, Brendan. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, Brendan something. You know, Brendan Small. Brendan Small. Yep. I didn't even look it up, folks. I figured it out. Yep. So, a um, little piece of, speaking of Small, the guy who played Smalls in um, uh, Derek Smalls or Dane Smalls or whatever yeah. in um, Spinal Tap, um, that guy actually does play bass, he actually is a talented singer, um, is also the voice of most of the characters in um, a certain place called Springfield. Yeah, yeah, The Simpsons. In a TV show called... The Simpsons. The Simpsons. Which, He's by the, the way, that's a great theme song, it's so well written. Anyway. It is. It is a fantastic theme song. So, um, I think the 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 last thing I want to leave people with, I on my side, is this: you take a you take a lesson from somebody. Um, don't expect to sound like them. Nope. That's all I want to say. Take some things away from it, but you won't sound right. like them. That's right. Because what happens is, uh, I get let uh, I get a student come in. And he'd say, hey, um, I want to play this. It was an ACDC song. So I would start them out on the rhythm parts. And like, no, 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 no. I want to, par- I want to play the lead. Like, yeah. you can't play this, this chugging chord. Do not ask me to teach you 375 notes over an eight bar blues, you know. Yeah, you need to know the, you need to know the blues part first, you know, like that what makes it what drives the piece. All right. So yeah. So with that being said, I have been David this time. And I have been Jim this time. And we might be different next time. Yeah, we might switch it up. <laughs> uh I might I might be uh, reassigned. And uh we have been the practical guitarists. Thank you. <laughs>